journalists or all different people. Good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone to the uh, Ms. Magazine Forum on Reproductive Health and Rights Worldwide. My name is Kathy Spiller. I'm the executive editor of Ms. Magazine, and I will be moderating today's panel. I wanted to welcome our panel this morning. Uh, we have uh, four uh, leading experts and advocates uh, for women's reproductive health and family planning. Joining us uh, today, Dr. Solomon Orero of Kenya. Dr. Nafis Sadek, former director of the United Nations Population Fund. Uh, uh, both Dr. Orero and Dr. Sadek are receiving uh, the Eleanor Roosevelt Global Women's Rights Awards uh, next week, presented by the Feminist Majority Foundation in Los Angeles. And uh, we're kind enough to come early to Washington and be part of efforts over the next couple of days to meet with members of Congress about this very critical issue of international family planning funding. Also uh, joining us today, Daniel Pellegrum of Pathfinder International and Eleanor Smeal of the Feminist Majority Foundation. I'm going to just briefly put uh, today's panel into context. Um, and then each of our panelists are going to make a presentation. Um, and then that will leave enough time at the end for questions and answers uh, from both the press and from um, advocates and participants who are here today. As many of you know, in the winter issue of Ms. Magazine, uh, copies of which uh, are on the table and in your press kits, we issued a special report on U.S. international family planning policies and their toll on women in the developing world. Although the United States is the largest donor country in actual dollars spent on international family planning, the U.S. contributes only about a third or less of what it promised along with other donor nations in 1994 at the United Nations uh, Conference on Population and Development in order to reach universal access to family planning and reproductive health in the developing world. Each year, funding falls short worldwide by some $7.5 billion to meet the world's family planning needs. In fact, overall, donor countries are now contributing just over half in real dollars what they were contributing in 1995. So uh, the, the uh, amount of uh, real dollars available for international family planning is decreasing. And significantly more of that budget is now devoted to fighting HIV AIDS. Less of it proportionally is devoted to family planning. Over the last decade, U.S. appropriations for international family planning funding have fallen by 40% in real terms. And now President Bush has proposed further cuts in his fiscal 2009 budget. Additionally, this administration has imposed harsh restrictions on U.S. international family planning aid and increasingly demanded that money be spent on abstinence-only programming. The global gag rule, uh, prohibits uh, funding programs in developing countries with U.S. monies that use their own funds or other countries' funds for referring uh, or counseling on abortion or for advocacy. And as a result of the global gag rule, supplies of contraceptives by the United States to some 20 developing countries now in Africa and Asia have been cut off. Inadequate family planning funding and inadequate supplies lead to higher unintended pregnancies and as a result, higher rates of maternal mortality from illness and complications from uh, uh, pregnancy as well as from unsafe abortion. Every year, some an estimated 536,000 women die from pregnancy or childbirth-related causes, and an estimated additional 70,000 women die every year from botched, unsafe abortions, either self-induced abortions or performed by untrained uh, non-medical personnel. These deaths are mostly preventable, and not to mention the millions more women who are permanently uh, or temporarily injured. I'll try to put in that into perspective. One woman dies every minute 
of every day, needlessly. Many of these women leave behind children. In fact, it's estimated that more than a million children are orphaned every year because of maternal deaths, preventable maternal deaths. Many of these children themselves will die because their mothers were largely responsible for their feeding and clothing and for their education. Current US policies are contributing to this death and injury. Currently, as you know, the US Congress is debating whether to increase international family planning funding. Advocates are pushing for a billion dollars, which will be more than double the current US contribution to international family planning funding, but still less than what the US should be doing. Also, of course, there is the effort to restore funding to the United Nations Population Fund, which the Bush administration unilaterally has cut off funding for the last six, uh, seven years. A large coalition of groups are working together, many of them here today, their leadership and their advocates, uh, to win the billion dollar allocation and to remove or, re or at least ease many of these uh, restrictions. Our panel will look at all of this this, uh, this afternoon. First, Daniel Pellegrim will address how current U.S. policies are impacting the ability to provide effective family planning and reproductive health to women in developing countries. Dan is president of, the, of Pathfinder International and since 1985 has led its family planning and reproductive health programs in more than 20 countries worldwide. Dan. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, Pathfinder International is pleased, and I am indeed honored uh, to join Ms. Magazine uh, and the Feminist Majority Foundation in recognizing two extraordinary and remarkable people and the work that they have done, uh, not just in their countries, but as people who have spoken out clearly um, and forcefully on the important issues that affect the lives of some of the most vulnerable people in the world. I thank Dr. Herrero and Nafi Sadek. <clears throat> Dr. Solomon Herrero is an outspoken advocate and dedicated physician who has seen firsthand the devastating effects of unsafe abortion and has worked uh, with Pathfinder's office in Kenya as a senior advisor uh, for our work in East Africa. He speaks with a clear and steady voice and with conviction and with compassion about the needs of women in his country. Dr. Sadek and I have known each other for an even longer time, and her voice has been a major and significant one on behalf of women worldwide in her role as the head of the UNFPA and since. She has been on the board of directors of Pathfinder for almost nine years. She speaks with power and passion. She indeed is an elegant and an eloquent voice in this movement. Both are extraordinary individuals, and each has made a tremendous contribution to advancing the rights of women and girls, and I am proud to be here and to congratulate them. Pathfinder International and its founder before it have been at the business of international family planning for uh, 80 uh, years or so, um, since the late 1920s when the founder of Pathfinder first started work in family planning. It was incorporated almost 30 years later, so for 50 years and under its current name and as an incorporated entity in the U.S., it has worked around the world in more than 100 countries during that time, providing family planning services, speaking on behalf of some of the world's most vulnerable people in order that they obtain and have access to reproductive health care. We believe that reproductive health care is a basic human right. Pathfinder believes that while all women should have access to safe abortion, it is also important and critical that they have access to family planning services because they are the essential first element in delivering reproductive health care to women who are the most vulnerable in the world's poorest countries. As an organization that receives U.S. funding for its work and has for uh, several decades, we have seen firsthand the impact of harmful U.S. policies like the global gag rule as well as the effects of decreased funding uh, in international family planning programs over these decades. 
As a recipient of U.S. funds, we have made our position on the critical issues very clear to the public and therefore to the Congress because our conscience requires us to do so. U.S. family planning assistance is one of the most successful interventions in the history of the U.S. foreign aid program. Yet funding for international family planning from the U.S. has declined in real dollars by about 40 percent in the last decade. While today more than half of the world's population will soon or is already approaching their reproductive years. The need is great and the stakes are very high. Worldwide, almost 200 million women want contraceptives, modern methods of birth control, but have no access to them. Indeed, Kenya, about which we will hear in a few moments, is a perfect example. With the assistance from the donor community, including but not limited to the U.S. government, Kenya reduced its fertility rate dramatically for several years, one of the fastest, perhaps the fastest, decline uh, in fertility rates ever recorded uh, since the history of family planning. And yet that has now plateaued and for a few years has now begun to reverse itself. The average number of children uh, in Kenya uh, per woman was at one point more than eight children on average per woman. It, is, it had declined by uh, uh, the late 19, um, uh, the mid 1990s, it had declined uh, to 4.5. It had made a steep decline and that's been uh, now leveled off, as I said, and going in the other direction. The need is enormous and the task is a big one. The U.S. must not only continue its support, it must increase that support uh, at the risk of turning back the clock. You'll hear now from the distinguished guests who I've mentioned earlier and saluted. First, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Salam Araro, uh, who has done extraordinary work in Kenya that I want you to hear about. Welcome. Come on up. I, I just wanted to, uh, a little more background. Uh, Dr. Solomon Herrero is an obstetrician and gynecologist, more than 20 years uh, practicing in the field of family planning and reproductive health training programs in uh, all of Eastern Africa, um, especially Kenya. Uh, he served as a senior reproductive health technical advisor for Pathfinder International and is the founder of Kisumu Medical and Educational Trust. Um, Dr. Herrero, is, as you know, will talk about the impact uh, that U.S. policies and, its, and the restrictions are having um, in Africa. Dr. Rao. Thank you very much, Daniel and Kathy, for that, those nice words. It was once said that he who travels far with an open mind, open eyes, and open ears learns a lot. It has been my privilege in the exploits of my travel throughout the globe, in Asia, Europe, America, and Africa in particular, to have learned a lot in the course of my duties that have been explained by Cathy. I have noted with a lot of admiration at the magnanimity of the African woman's heart. The African woman in pursuit of sustaining the human race has been made to believe her role is to reproduce. She has been made to believe she has to shoulder that role and the burden of reproduction and the consequences without any complaint. She has been made to believe that in that process she must produce more males, and if she doesn't, then that is her mistake. She takes it all and can still afford to smile. To crown it all, even the biblical mythology 
has put her, has been interpreted by the males that she is subordinate to the male. Ladies and gentlemen, before I came here, I had the misfortune to see and take care of a woman, 38 years old, she was pregnant with her 15th child. She came with obstructed labor. She arrived late. She had ruptured her uterus. Because of the delays we have in executing emergency services, we did not have blood. Theater was not ready. We had a few things missing. We lost her while watching. She left 14 children, seven boys, seven girls. What annoyed me most, why did she have to deliver that 15th child? Did she really need it? She was not there to answer that question. But between you and me, given a choice, given a privilege, given ability, she would not have gone up to the 15th child. She would have done something about it. When we were auditing her death, many times she cried that she has the burden. She couldn't access a fertility regulation. Ladies and gentlemen, that is just but one. Like Daniel mentioned, a number of years ago, we had a very thriving family planning program, which was supported, which was managed from support from the U.S. Unfortunately, my country, as I speak to you today, even with the full knowledge of the benefits to the society, to the country, to the community, to the family, to the woman, and to the children. My government, only the last one year, was able to give a token budget of 0.6% of the Ministry of Health budget to reproductive health programs and family planning. That is, as I mentioned, a token. It didn't do much. It doesn't do much. It is interesting to note that women all over the world, and women will bear me witness, given a chance, would like to have the number of children they can comfortably care for, the number of children they can comfortably look after, and the number of children they can look at who are healthy, who are growing up well. A lot of the time, they are forced onto quantity rather than quality children. In the course of my work, and this is, you can check in the internet anyway, walk into any hospital in my country, walk into a gynecological ward, you'll find that between 50 to 62 percent of the women admitted in those wards are admitted because of complications of unsafe abortion. Unsafe abortion occurs because a woman has had a pregnancy she didn't intend to have, she doesn't intend to have. In my practice, I have not, I'm yet to come across a woman who goes out to conceive willingly, and then willingly goes out to remove that pregnancy. No woman in her right senses will go out, plan, have a pregnancy, and then plan to remove it. That woman does not exist. However, on the other end of the stick, any woman who for one reason or another conceives an unwanted an intended pregnancy, and he decides that she is not going to keep that pregnancy, will remove it, even if she is dying in the process. 
Unfortunately, in countries like mine, where abortion services are restricted, a lot of the time it is done, that removal is done by people who do not know what they are doing. They do not know how to remove it. The consequences are a lot of women die from it. Last month, in the teaching hospital, uh, I was doing a training of health providers on how to manage women who have suffered complications of unsafe abortion. In the world, we had three women who, because they had unsafe abortion, we had to remove their uteruses. We had to resect and anastomose some of their intestines. And we had to create a bypass for them to pass tool, what we call a colostomy. That was last month. I was working, I was doing for some work for Pathfinder. We were training providers on how to manage and safe a person. These are consequences which, one, they are by and large arising because a woman did not have access to family planning services. Ladies and gentlemen, looking at all that, you deny a woman fertility regulations, she will have unwanted pregnancy. If you force her to have a pregnancy, the chances of her death in the subsequent pregnancies are high. Complications in pregnancies increase by the index number of the pregnancy. In fact, in certain parts of the countries where I come from, a woman who conceives has signed her death sentence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Herrera. Now it's our privilege uh, to be joined at this panel by an international and leading expert on uh, family planning and women's health, Dr. Nafis Sadiq, uh, is an obstetrician and gynecologist as well, um, special advisor to the Secretary General of the United Nations and a UN special envoy for HIV AIDS in, in Asia and the Pacific. As you know, she was the former executive director of the United Nations Population Fund and chaired the historic 1994 Conference on Population and Development, at which the US and other donor nations set the goal of universal access to family planning. Dr. Sadek will talk about what needs to be done now to reach that goal. Dr. Sadek. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, oh, maybe it's too down. Thank you very much, um, Catherine. Um, um, as you have noted, I've spent most of my life um, working at the United Nations, but even before that life, I did have a life in, in uh, Pakistan where, in fact, I started my career and where I got a lot of my experience and uh, where I started to make the connections between women's health women's rights, uh, their, the whole circumstances in which they lived, and their health, particularly their reproductive health, and how their decisions on reproductive matters were really not their decisions, but really controlled by men, by their families, and by what society expected them to do. So in a sense, the whole International Conference on Population and Development came out of that evolution um, uh, of ideas which connected women's rights with reproductive health and rights and their present situation and continuing um, ill health and the lack of attention still dominates uh, policies around the world. At that conference, 179 um, countries uh, 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 agreed to secure universal access to reproductive health care by the year 2015. And as we know, we are still a long way uh, from there. That was in 1994. The question that's posed to me today is what must we do to reach uh, universal access to reproductive health and family planning? And my simple answer would be just implement the International Conference on Population and Development, all those recommendations, we've all agreed to them and they have been reinforced in many subsequent meetings. 
but I know that's not how you want me to answer that question. Um, how have we done so far, and what do you think should be done in the future? I think that's a huge subject, and time is short, but so I'd like to make just very three brief points. One of them has actually been made by Dan, that progress, um, uh, in my travels in a large number of countries, I've been really um, enormously impressed by the strides that have been made, not only at the national government level, but at civil society levels, and in particular, the women's groups and women's organizations on you know, getting the two sets of rights together and working on them. Reproductive health care and services has become a, no, um, a normal expectation in most of our countries. Um, I'm not just talking about family planning, of course, but reproductive health in general, because the whole idea in, in Cairo was to have an integrated set of services, which include reproductive health family, and included family planning, sexual and reproductive health, and also rights. Uh, also means motherhood. It also means uh, treatment and and the prevention of sexually transmitted diseases, of which HIV AIDS today is one of the most um, predominant ones. The idea that all women and men too are entitled to reproductive health and have the right to demand it and to make the decisions for themselves is really being accepted, but of course it really lags in the implementation. And this brings me to my second point, that there's a huge gap between expectation and the services um, that they were expected to have been provided by the year 2015. It's already 2008. We're really very far from, uh, from uh, doing that. It's a fact that more than six out of 10 women in Africa, Asia, and Latin America now do have access uh, but you know this covers uh, the, the 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 real picture because you get access in some of the larger countries which are richer but you don't have access in most of the poor countries a lot of the de uh, developing countries in africa and in fact in a large part of south asia where a huge number of the people of the world live there is progress, but it is also a fact that most of these women are in the 12 larger countries, as I just um, uh, uh, said. Um, uh, but, and most of, many of these services are um, not um, complete. Life has changed very little for a lot of the women in the world. They do not have access to all the family planning, um, antenatal care or skilled attendance at birth. They do not have HIV AIDS prevention um, uh, information and services. They do not even know that they have the right to demand these things. And that's one of the issues that we really have to deal with as far as rights of women are concerned in many of our societies. Many health systems, and I would say a lot of health systems, even though there's so much attention being given to women's health and reproductive health and, and family planning and HIV AIDS, which are all in the same bunch, but they still do not give enough emphasis to the whole a holistic approach to reproductive health care, even in some of the middle income countries uh, with well developed health systems. Uh, so we should ask the questions why do countries put prevention and caring for HIV AIDS patients? ahead of, for example, helping women protect themselves from those infections. You know, you see the increasing feminization of HIV AIDS is the question that I keep asking. Why, you know, we are doing so much for HIV and I'm a, I'm a special envoy of the Secretary General for AIDS in Asia and the Pacific. And I keep saying that while we're, you know, looking at prevention, we're, we're forgetting about half the population of the world, which is increasingly getting infected with HIV. And even here in this country, even though I'm not responsible for the US, the African American population is really being, uh, you know, very much decimated by HIV. I would, shouldn't use the word decimated, but affected by HIV AIDS. And there's not much attention to, to, to that issue also. Many African women are getting um, affected in the United States. And it's something that, it's something inherent in being a woman. I often ask my quest, this question, what is it that makes all these policymakers forget that women are half the population and need their rights and need them now? 
The answer is, of course, that women are yet not powerful enough to make their voices heard. We need um, the Ms. Magazines and the feminist majorities all over the world. We need the strong voices in each of our countries and around the world to, do, to, to demand these things. This brings me to my third and final point. Many donor countries have increased um, their you know, policy emphasis, their funding, and even programs for health and some even for reproductive health. But family planning within that context is lagging far behind. And the separation of HIV AIDS and sexual and reproductive health is, in my opinion, not the best approach to deal with some of the, uh, with these two important um, issues. Um, it's um, I, I, you know I think they've forgotten that um, reproductive health, which is what they agreed to in Cairo, is a vital cont contribution to the ending of poverty, especially ending of poverty for women-headed households. It is a contribution to a more secure and peaceful world. For example, you, you are all hearing about the current crisis, about food supplies and climate change. Women are very much in the, the middle. They are the chief producers of food in Africa, for example, and even in Asia. Many women do a lot of the farm and food production work, but women don't get the support that they need, especially in the area of reproduction and reproductive health. We know that support for reproductive health and family planning works. Uh, and donors know that because they've seen the example of programs and they know that all the countries of the world in the developing world have made a commitment to reproductive health and uh, services. And yet, yet, in spite of proven effectiveness, there is not the resource uh, coming. And of course, one element in this is one major donor. I won't name the major donor. Um, which is, you know, which has put this ideological bent to these uh, programs and the way these programs are being addressed. And we don't need ideology. We need science and evidence to have good programs. And no donor should uh, make conditions which are based on its own ideology because we're talking about a multicultural world and we need to find ways to support programs based on evidence and on science. I think this administration deserves a lot of credit for the, the amount of funds they put for HIV and AIDS, but even here, the money could have been a lot more effective if it was not linked with ideological approaches. One third for abstinence only, which we know gets wasted totally. Uh, you, know, not a, you know, not enough attention, no, no support for um, sex workers, which is one of the principal drivers in many of our countries. So all I'm, I'm saying, I'm not you know, cast, casting judgment on anyone's um, uh, views. You should have your views, but you should apply them to yourself. You should not apply them to the world at large, and especially a large donor, which has so much authority and power around the world, should not allow these kinds of um, views to come in the way of good programs. So the medical profession is from which, to which I belong does not make moral judgments. If a man comes to the emergency room with a bullet wound, we don't ask him, did he own a gun? Was he a supporter of the gun lobby or not? And, and blah, blah, blah. If a sex worker comes and she has an infection, we don't ask her how, you know, what are your morals, etc. You treat the person, and if it's something that is infectious, you, you also try to help that that infection doesn't affect the whole com community. So we just treat him or we treat her. But if a woman needs contraception, why should we ask her what she does for a living? I mean, it doesn't make sense to me. Or what if someone has got HIV AIDS, should we now say you're immoral and therefore you should not have any um, uh, attention? I'm just you know, trying to be rhetorical in my questions, but my point is that you know, people who work in development, in health, you have to look at the outcome for which you are working, which is to improve the health of individuals, 
especially in my case, I think women are the key to the progress and future of families, to the health of the family, and to the, 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 the peace and security of the rest of the world. So we need good programs, we need unconditional programs, and we need a lot more funding for reproductive health and family planning programs. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Sadek. Uh, and our final panelist this morning, Ellie Smeal, president of the Feminist Majority Foundation. For 30 years, she's played a pivotal role in the modern women's rights movement as a political strategist and grassroots organizer. Smeal leads the Feminist Majority's efforts to promote women's rights as a central feature in U.S. foreign policy, particularly policies which enhance the economic and political power of women and ensure access to family planning. Ellie? The whole time I was listening to uh, Dr. Herrero and Dr. Sadiq, uh, I'm struggling to how do you wrap this up and how do you uh, paint the picture of the suffering. I keep, uh, uh, Dr. Herrero has so vividly uh, pictured it, uh, not only here but in many different uh, platforms uh, that he sees on a daily basis. We, we, we throw out numbers. Uh, but we, I don't think we, we, we can picture what each number means. 70,000 women annually die of unsafe abortion needlessly because, and we contribute to that mayhem. 70,000, picture it. Picture what that means, day in and day out, deaths unnecessary. We talk about women, but Dr. Herrero has mentioned repeatedly that we're talking about 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds, 15-year-olds. We have an international policy, we the United States in our funding, which we talk about abstinence only, but the women and girls who want access to family planning are married women, 200 million, and I think those numbers are underestimates. Um, we're talking about a culture where a woman could, where a girl can be patrol, uh, pledged to marriage at the age of 10, be married at the age of what we would consider preteens almost, uh, 14, 15 years old. And we're talking about her being able to negotiate abstinence only in a marriage. I mean, it's not possible. And yet, for some of these young girls and women, the very getting pregnant is almost like signing a death warrant because the rising, rising, rising numbers of young girls dying and young women dying. In, Af in Afghanistan, a country we promised a Marshall Plan, today, not some other day, today, one in six women will die because of a, uh, a, a pregnancy. One in six over the course of their life. One in six will die. In the United States, it's one in 2,900. In Sweden, that has access, uh, universal access to health care and to contraception, it's one in 29,000 that will die. So you are having all these unnecessary deaths, but we're not even counting the suffering. Thousands upon thousands, millions suffering needlessly. 500,000, when you say 529,000 needless deaths, that's according to the UN, a year from uh, pregnancies, which could be prevented, complications of pregnancies. Then think of the millions who are injured. Both of these doctors have seen uh, health care uh, systems in which there are more women in the maternity ward because of injury or fighting death from unsafe abortion than are there for the pregnancy that, of a delivery. 
These unsafe abortion beds or wards are taken from a system that is already stressed. So people are dying and suffering needlessly. Now let's look at our policies. We give less than 2% of our international development aid to family planning, even though we know that it saves lives and is the best single investment we can make. We then tie into it policies of this global gag rule, which withholds contraceptives right now, as Kathy said, I think it's actually from 16 developing nations, because they cannot comply with this rule. And something like um, 13 major family planning agencies, creating more crisis to overworked systems. So what's happening with the women's movement is we're determined to get rid of the silo that puts domestic family planning and, and reproductive health policies in one little basket and international into another, and to understand the whole of it. Because as we are cutting family planning access globally through our policies, by cutting in real dollars, even though the population is expanding, you know, uh, we're now 6.5 billion, and we were in the, I think in the, when I was in, uh, it wasn't 100 years ago either, <laughs> although some days it feels that long. Um, it was like a couple billion people. We're now at 6.5 <laughs> billion people. So the needs keep going up just by the sheer quantity of people, we are decreasing in absolute dollars by 40%. And we are doing it's the same thing domestically. As our population has increased from the mid-50s to something like 150 million to now over 300 million, we are decreasing in absolute dollars, access to family planning to the poorest of poor in our own country, rising the need for abortion. In fact, on the excuse of abortion, they are creating policies that are increasing the need for it, and in fact the incidence of it, and of course the suffering and uh, the lack of uh, health resources. So we are organizing to try to reverse these policies, and I think somehow we have got to put on the table the horrid suffering of the young and poor women here in our own country, but mostly right now where you can see it most clearly, in the developing world. We have to do something now. And it doesn't matter who the president is, it doesn't matter who the Congress is, we have to organize to create the will and the need for the change and to reverse these disastrous policies. Right now, in both houses of Congress, we do not have a majority on many reproductive health policies yet. We certainly don't have it for legal abortion, and it clearly we do not have the will to, to create the priority to increase the funding. And we brag about how much we're giving to, to, US, uh, to aid policies, fighting H, HIV AIDS, but we're now starting to put restrictions on it so that the global gag rule is getting snuck in, or at least there's an effort to do it. And when you think in terms of Africa, that the face of AIDS is now a woman, what are we doing by putting restricted policies that will just make the suffering worse? We cannot afford this um, thinking, and uh, this, this silo thinking. And so we're not going to. We're organizing on college campuses. We're organizing in women's communities. There are so many organizations now who are getting the gestalt that our policies are contributing to mayhem, to injury, and to death needlessly of young girls and young women throughout the developing world. And we are determined to help to reverse it. Thank you, Ellie.
We can open this up for questions and answers now if, or if any of our panelists have another thought. Uh, uh, but uh, anyone who wants to ask a question, please. Always the first. Yes. Do you want to stand up? Yeah. I want to clarify, of course it matters who's president. What I meant is, uh, or who's the Congress, is that, it, is that no matter who the Congress and who the president, a galvanized citizenry will ultimately not be ignored. And we must galvanize more. Yes, it is possible that we will change the presidency, and many of us hope for that. Um, but also, we have to mobilize sometimes the greatest gains for women's rights have been during election seasons. Needless to say, I'll just give you some dates. 1972, Title IX passed, giving women sex education, I mean, um, equal educational opportunity in our country. Nixon was the president, a Republican, right before an election. Then it was gutted by a Republican named Reagan in his administration in 1984 with the Grove City case in the Supreme Court. We reinstituted it under Bush 1 in 1988. We didn't wait for what was going to happen. We were not going to lose another generation of women. And because of the fear of the election, I believe that the Restoration Act was passed. We are in a very tight election season. We know Elections are very close. We can get more attention to politicians during this type of time than maybe any other time. But I also think we got to keep in our brain the suffering of these young girls and women and know that every day that passes, more needlessly die and suffer. So we cannot just wait for the ideal time. And I believe as you build the chances, if there is a relief in these policies, of, uh, it'll happen faster. I don't think we should be just asking for a billion. I think it should be seven billion. Let's be real, folks. We needed seven billion for the shortfall in 1994. You know what inflation has done. The dollar's worth 50 cents of what it was. And so what are we doing every time we bargain low? Think of that young kid that's dying in, 50, in some ward in general, Canada, Nairobi Hospital. Think of these, these, the suffering that has to stop. So yes, it matters who's president. Yes, it matters who's in political office. But it also matters our determination. And we must build that determination so that we don't keep coming back talking about suffering. That is needless. There are things we don't have the solution for. We do have the solutions. We can reduce the level of unintended pregnancy. Any other? You want to take a shot at that, Dan? Or, uh, well, I, yeah, I, I, you know, look, I, I find myself um, one of the for 30 consecutive years, there's been um, 550, 580, depending on the statistics, thousand women who die every year because of pregnancy-related issues. Most of those are preventable deaths. Most of them would be, pre be prevented uh, with good health care. We heard the numbers. They know the one in six uh, women in, in Africa uh, compared to one in 4,000 or 4,800 uh, in, in more developed countries. But I, I'm, I am, um, I am, for year after year, for 30 years, more than a half a million women dying because of pregnancy-related issues, I'm sure of very few things. I am absolutely sure of very few things, but I am absolutely sure that if men were as likely to die from the sex act as women, something in 30 years would have changed.
Another question. If not, um, Dr. Arrero or Dr. Sadek, do you have any additional remarks you'd like to add? Uh, I was going to say that in this country, uh, you know, a lot of actions take place because the public demands it. And I'm not sure that the public is demanding enough attention to international uh, family planning and reproductive health. And maybe that's something that we need to think about. I think most um, young women have grown up with their rights having been dis you know, given to them. And they don't think that those rights are under threat, which they are you know, under many administrations in this country. And um, they feel quite secure that it wouldn't happen. And what's I think what Eleanor was saying, I think is very true, is what would be unconstitutional within the United States is applied to the international um, aid uh, uh, bill, which you know restricts, uh, with the restrictions, the gag rule, et cetera, to all our, our countries. And it would be unconstitutional here. You couldn't do that in the United States. So if it's unconstitutional here and undemocratic, how is it democratic to do this outside in the rest of the world is something that has always bothered me. And it makes me feel that your domestic agenda, which you can't implement here for some groups and the lobbies uh, that support those groups, you are trying to show them that you are giving them something by punishing the rest of the world. And I think this is totally, totally, I mean, uh, undemocratic, to say the least, uh, to it. And somehow this has not ever been um, pointed out. And obviously in the courts, the Center for Reproductive Rights has lodged some cases and has not won. So that's one issue. It's somehow we need to get more public uh, support for this. The second is I think we, um, uh, as I was saying in the conference in London on women deliver, and we were, you know, quoting the same figures and, you know, wringing our hands, we have to find another approach. Uh, but, you know, the figures speak for themselves. Obviously, the figures have, have been saying this since 94. I mean, when, in fact, the world attention was caught by at the Cairo conference on the, you know, the 350,000 women or 500,000 women dying each year. But you know, that number has just not changed. So obviously, we need to do something to change our message. Uh, what that is, is something, um, and as Dan says, maybe we have to find a way to get the figures you know, transferred from women dying to men dying. And I'm not sure how you do that. But you, know, you need some way to get attention. Mr. Jeremiah here was here yesterday. He got a lot of attention. Maybe you have to think of things like he does to get the world's attention. <laughs> Well, and uh, to Ellie's point, how clear it has become. Um, yeah. The connections between the restrictive policies internationally and increasingly the restrictive policies here, how uh, these uh, the, practices the are first implemented internationally where they're more invisible to the American public, uh, they have come home. And, yeah. and we are fighting the same battles, the same opponents, um, and uh, the same issues. Uh, the importance of linking the two, very critical. Uh, Dr. Herrera, would you like to um, add anything? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I want to add on to what Dr. Sadiq has mentioned. The attainment of the Millennium Development Goals that was set in this country in the year 2000, by the year 2015, in most of our countries are dependent on the well-being of the woman. Unfortunately for us, the leadership role in terms of support, in terms of funding that is executed by the United States will determine as to whether the Millennium Development Goals on Health, HIV AIDS, child health, maternal mortality, all those are dependent on the well-being of the woman. The woman is a teacher, the woman is a leader, the woman is an opinion shaper, the woman is virtually everything. I'm sorry to say this as a man, but I've observed it all. <laughs> and it is on that note that I've passionately chosen to work with women, work for women, I live with them, and actually love them. <coughs> Does anyone have any further questions or? 
I, I want to thank everyone um, here today. Many of you are working in the trenches day in and day out on these issues and uh, deserve uh, our gratitude for keeping pushing. Uh, we cannot lose heart in these difficult times. We actually have the opportunity to move ahead. Um, and with the kinds of stories and information um, uh, today we, we can push our agenda even further and, and so uh, I want to thank all of you and invite you to stay around a little longer um, individually um, interacting with our panelists um, and um, again uh, thank you and look forward to seeing you again soon.